there, there are three seats open. Um, we'd love to all see everyone here or there. Um, and um, last but not least, I'd like to welcome uh, both uh, um, Andrew Yang and uh, Steve Marchand and thank them for, for their time. And come on up, guys. Thanks. It's great to be back. Uh, I, I don't know if you all know. Hey, how you doing, guys? Um, I went to high school uh, at Phillips Exeter, so uh, graduated in '92. There you go. How many people here wish that you had graduated in 1992? That's pretty good. <laughs> but it's remarkable. I mean, uh, a, a quick look at your bio uh, suggests you're a pretty good candidate for American Dream, right? First generation American. Uh, great education. Take it to uh, go to uh, Brown, right? And then law degree at Columbia. Not to brag, but so far so good. Uh, practice corporate law. Decide that's not what you want to do. Become an entrepreneur. Succeed in a winding way that I think folks would love to hear about. And, and at this point, married, you got kids. Yeah. You could be home. You could be doing a lot of things, but you're here in New Hampshire. That's, we love it. But uh, you're working. So why are you doing that instead of counting money or doing something else like that? Counting money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, after my company was sold in 2009, it was a very tough time for the country. It was the financial crisis aftermath. Uh, and I'd, I'd seen all these whiz kids heading to Wall Street um, and Silicon Valley, and I thought, it'd be great if they went and did something better than that. But you can't just be negative and complain about something. So I quit my job. I started an organization called Venture for America to help train hundreds of entrepreneurs uh, in places like Providence, Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, Baltimore, and help create several thousand jobs uh, over the next five or six years. And I became convinced that the reason why Donald Trump's our president today is that we automated away four million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all the swing states you needed to win. And my friends in Silicon Valley, and I have a bunch of them, know that we're about to do the same thing to millions of retail jobs, call center jobs, fast food jobs, and most disastrously, truck driving jobs in the years to come. And so this is the fourth industrial revolution. We're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the country. Donald Trump is the symptom. He's the manifestation. And so uh, I'm running for president because we need to wake up Americans to the fact that it is not immigrants that are causing economic problems. It is the fact that technology has advanced our economy to a point where more Americans are having trouble finding meaningful paths forward. And then as a Democratic Party, we need to uh, propose meaningful solutions to help address the problems I got Donald Trump elected. So as much as I love my kids and my family, uh, this seemed a lot more important. And so I said, you know what, like, uh, I can take this message to the American people and hopefully start to, cause some, uh, start to solve some of these problems and improve people's lives. The, the centerpiece, and you alluded to, uh, you've, uh, listening to a lot of your, your interviews, and you've caught fire in a way the last few months that uh, uh, gets you on the debate stage starting this summer and is getting you a lot of attention relative to even, say, six months ago. But the centerpiece deals with the freedom dividend, or what some folks would call uh, universal basic income. Um, talk a little bit about that for the folks at home that maybe have, are not familiar. And uh, it seems like not the sexiest thing to build a candidacy around, but it's rather impactful once you hear the details. Oh, I think it's very sexy myself. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> so um, so I, I was just saying hello to Jody and Chuck Fossey, who are, are receiving the freedom dividend here in New Hampshire uh, in, in Gosstown. <laughs> Uh, and what we're doing for Jody and Chuck, we'd like to be able to do for everyone in the country. So uh, the Freedom Dividend is a policy where every American adult gets $1,000 a month free and clear starting at age 18. And those of you here in the room and, and watching this think like, wow, that sounds literally too good to be true. Uh, but then you look at our history. Thomas Paine was for this at the founding of the country. He called it the Citizen's Dividend. Martin Luther King championed it in 1967, the year before he was killed. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists uh, endorsed it, said this would be tremendous for America. And one state has had a dividend for 37 years where everyone in that state receives between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked. And what state is that? Alaska. And how do they fund it? Oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology, Technology that's right. <laughs> so what, what they're doing for people in Alaska with oil, we can do for everyone here in New Hampshire and around the country with technology money. And think about what $1,000 a month would mean for the people you know in your communities, in your families. 
uh, it would be a game changer for, for many, many people right here in New Hampshire. A uh, lot of folks, you, you alluded to Milton Friedman yes. espousing this. Uh, nobody will mistake in him as a bastion of the liberal, of the left, right? He's the free market, he's the, the godfather of the free market economics. Um, why, one of the most common questions I hear asked after you describe it is how the heck you're going to pay for it? The too good to be true sort yeah, of follow-up? too good to be true uh, follow-up. Tell folks about how we pay for that. Yes. So how much did Amazon pay in federal taxes in 2018? Zero. Zero. That's right. Less than you all. How much did Netflix pay in uh, federal taxes? Zero. Also zero. So you have to look around, and it's not just those two companies. You can go uh, down the list where the big winners from artificial intelligence and all these new technologies are going to be the biggest companies that are great at just not paying a lot of tax. And so the trap we're in right now, Amazon's getting another $20 billion in business every year, and it's causing 30% of American malls and Main Street stores to close. Now, what's the most common job in the economy? Retail. The average retail worker is a 39-year-old woman making between uh, 10 and $12 an hour. And we know that most Americans don't have a, a ton of savings. And so Amazon, sucking up business, Malls and stores close, workers don't know what to do, and Amazon pays zero in taxes. Uh, and so how are you going to end up getting some of the gains from all these new innovations? What we need to do is we need to join every other advanced economy in the world and have a value-added tax, which would then give everyone in New Hampshire a slice of every Amazon sale, every Google search, every Facebook ad, and eventually every robot truck mile. And then put this money into your hands. It would grow your economy by $8 billion uh, or almost 14%, um, and some of that money would float back up to Amazon, uh, you know, and they'd get a little bit of it back. But we have to, to make sure that Americans are in position to benefit from all these innovations that are going in, and right now we are not. Uh, it seems like, disproportionately, the jobs that are at greatest threat in the near future are a certain type that you might say disproportionately is blue collar. Not exclusively blue collar, though, listening to some of the long-term ramifications. This is, this is going to affect everybody. Yeah, so as Steve said, I was a, uh, a corporate attorney for five unhappy months. Um, so I know that job can be automated. Uh, say, same with accounting, bookkeeping, uh, uh, a lot of insurance, brokerage jobs, financial advisory, uh, eventually radiology. Actually, radiology, they can, they can automate right now. AI can see tumors on a film. Uh, more clearly than any human eye can. And so it starts out as a, like a truck, well, it starts out, started out as a manufacturing worker displacement, but then it's going to morph into retail workers and call center workers, and then eventually bookkeepers, accountants. Right now, the underemployment rate for a recent college graduate in this country is 44%. So if you graduate from college and you expect to have a secure path forward, uh, instead you have this massive debt load and 94% of the new jobs that are created are temporary gig or contract jobs. And part of that is because a lot of the firms have already been automating away the entry-level white-collar jobs that you might have gotten 10, 20 years ago. So as you say, we're in the third inning of this game, right? It's, it's well underway, but some might say, uh, why is this time different, right? In the history of uh, 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 destructive growth, right? Where you have elements creative destroying destruction. the economy. creative destruction. Yeah. Uh, the buggy whip uh, manufacturing industry, you know, took a big hit in the early 20th century, but we saw what came after. How come this time is different from those other times? Uh, so uh, this time, the technology is going to impact a broader and more diverse range of industries and occupations faster than in previous historical periods. Uh, so. Uh, as, a, as a reference, Bain projects that we're going to eliminate three to four times as many jobs more quickly than happened during the Industrial Revolution that most people think of as the comparison, like the first Industrial Revolution. Um, and the first Industrial Revolution was a very unpleasant time. Uh, there were mass riots that killed dozens of Americans and caused billions of dollars worth of damage. We uh, we implemented universal high school in 1911 in part as a response to all of these social changes. Um, Labor Day became a holiday. Labor unions were formed in 1886 in part because of the need to agitate for worker rights. So the people who say we've been through this before with the Industrial Revolution, one, that was a tough, tough, turbulent time that had massive responses, and two, experts believe that this time is going to be three to four times faster and more vicious. You mentioned the scapegoat that is immigration 
uh, whenever uh, we have tough economic times, there's a, always a subset of Americans who will say if we just cut down on immigration, uh, that would solve the problem. And, and we know that's not so. Um, what about globalization and uh, the relationship that has to automation, but also separate from that as a factor in all this dynamic you're describing? Yeah, so I dug into the numbers. Uh, we lost 5 million manufacturing jobs between 2000 and now. Uh, and according to economists and studies and people who've dug into it, 80% of that was due to automation and machines. And about 20% was due to globalization and pushing the factory labor to a another country. And if you go to a factory today, you'll see it's wall-to-wall, -wall, giant robot arms, uh, and then a relatively small handful of people walking around ministering um, to the robots. Uh, it's not like you walk in and it's like wall-to-wall -wall immigrants. I mean, like that, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's not. Um, and so, uh, so the numbers don't bear out the narrative that it's somehow immigrants causing this uh, dislocation, but it's much easier to blame immigrants than it is an economic system that puts uh, machines uh, ahead of people in more and more situations. What's the hardest part of selling this? Because I, I believe you're the only candidate uh, for president this year who is openly in support. I hear, I think you're starting to have some impact on other candidates that are not dismissing it. How about that? But you're the only one I think that's saying, guys, this is a big deal and this is a big idea for a big solution. How's the salesmanship process going and what's the hardest part thus far of making the sale? Well, you know, it's fun. I mean, most Americans are just tuning in. Uh, they're not like you all in New Hampshire where they're avidly paying attention to, <laughs> to, to 2020. Um, but I, I just tell Americans uh, like what we're going through as a country. Our life expectancy has declined for the last three years uh, because of a surge in drug overdoses and suicides. Our labor force participation rate is at 63.2%, the same level as Ecuador and Costa Rica and almost one in five prime working age American men hasn't worked in the last year. So we have these rosy stats uh, that obscure the dark reality. And Donald Trump ran on the reality. And the reality actually has not changed that much uh, during the last two years. So when you talk about the salesmanship, it's again just trying to draw attention to what people are actually experiencing. And to me, it's up to the Democratic Party to again enact meaningful solutions to the problems that got Donald Trump elected instead of just dismissing those concerns of tens of millions of Americans. The uh, uh, very few candidates, I, I would say no other candidate, has as much detail on his or her website as you do. Uh, I'm not sure what you're up to in terms of uh, policy number. <laughs> yeah, what's the number now? You're you're in many many dozens at this point. Yeah, we're at something like 75, um, and uh, we're gonna release another like 25 or so in the next month. We're gonna like release a policy a day. Um, uh, just because we have them. Uh, we've actually had them for a while. I think there's one reason why I like Steve, because Steve's also very wonky and likes policies. <laughs> for those of you who've uh, you know, been to his events, I'm sure he... he <laughs> um, but to, to me, again, we have to start focusing on uh, real solutions for the American people instead of arguing in symbols uh, and uh, various like wars of words or, or cultural messages. I don't think that's what Americans are looking for at this point. Uh, you, uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned uh, suicide rates. Um, uh, on a personal level, this is something that has affected uh, my family in the last few years, and it opened my mind up to, at events that I was having, bringing up the topic. And once somebody would bring it up, the number of people in an audience like this who would say, all right, you've opened the door, I've been touched in some way, attempted suicide, different outcomes, uh, successful, unsuccessful, um, you realize how many people are, are dealing with this and how complicated the issue is. The gun issue, yes. the mental health issue, healthcare in general. Um, talk a little bit about this relationship between, in a case like this, mental health, how we get our healthcare in this system in general, guns, they're all related, but um, how do you see them connected? Where does that fit in your prioritization in public policy? Well, I'm very, very passionate about uh, investing in Americans' mental health because you can see we're at crisis levels of anxiety and depression uh, uh, and mental health issues. My brother is a psychology professor, and so I know that we can do much, much more. Um, and part of it is that we have this messed up healthcare system that's not driven by our health. It's driven by revenue. Like when you show up, it's just like, hey, I have financial incentives attached to certain things, and like, lo and behold, like, I'm actually gonna do more of those things. 
um, there are, are some environments where they actually tie together uh, your physical health and mental health because there's a, a, a mental health element to many, many problems. Like if you come in because of some sort of drug addiction, that's not just like a physical addiction, like that often has something um, to, to do with your uh, mental and emotional state. So the real challenge for us is to try and have a healthcare system that is not driven by money. It's actually driven by what's best for us. That's a massive change, but I'm happy to say that now there's a huge appetite for that change because Americans are waking up to the fact that our healthcare system is breaking our back in many, many ways. Where if you get sick or injured in this country, you're more stressed out about navigating the system and paying for it than you are getting well or getting help. And there's no reason for that. We are the richest, most advanced economy in the history of the world. We can do much, much better in terms of putting resources into people's hands that actually can help address some of the, the crisis we're experiencing in mental health in particular. On the health care issue, Democrats in this field are in the big uh, spectrum of policy positions are in the, the same general area. There aren't huge differences. Thank you, Bernie think. Sanders. Right? <laughs> there you go. And, uh, um, <laughs> but there is a little range in there from uh, Medicare for all or bust and something that says more um, you can buy into Medicare, but you could keep your private insurance and the potential disruption of eliminating private insurance in a short period of time. So there's this range yes. in there. Where do, you see, where do you fit in that range? Uh, I'm in the robust public option, um, Medicare for all, but don't eliminate private insurance off the, the, the bat. I mean, if you do it right, then your public option will end up making private insurance unappealing and unnecessary in many environments. Um, but that's in many ways for us to accomplish, um, you know, and, and then you also have a little bit of a time lag for the industry to adjust. Um, it's America, there's going to be private insurance in my opinion, um, and that's not a terrible thing for a really good public option because if you have some uh, gold-plated concierge plans, then they can invest resources in various innovations that we can then benefit from um, in the public space. When you uh, look back, uh, at your own uh, experience, both as uh, growing up in an immigrant household, uh, higher education as an entrepreneur, that brief miserable period as a corporate lawyer, the whole thing. Uh, what are things that you look back at your life and uh, that had the greatest uh, shaping on how you see the world through public policy today? You know, um, so after my startup went bust, because like, you know, you're sitting up here, it's like obviously like, oh, illustrious career, blah, blah, blah. But like my, the, the company I started in my mid-20s uh, flopped. And so I have so much respect. How many of you all are entrepreneurs who start a business or run, run your own business or anything? Like, you know how hard it is. I know how hard it is. And you also, unfortunately, have to like put on a brave face all the time for everyone else. Be like, How's it going? Does it go? It's going great. <laughs> and then you like, go back. Um, and so, number one is I'm very passionate about small businesses uh, and the purpose, the vitality that they provide in the community. I just think it's so beautiful when you have a small business that grows and it hires people and like puts people to work in a way that's, um, that's positive and productive. I, I, the software company I worked at after my company went bust was a healthcare technology company. So I understand mm -hmm. the incentives in the healthcare system. Um, and how, frankly, broken that system is, like how, how just completely overrun by money um, our healthcare system is. Uh, and then uh, I ran a, a national education company that grew to become number one in the United States, um, so I have very strong feelings about education, too. Um, someone joked, it's like, wow, Andrew, it's like, almost like you were taking a tour of the economy in case you decide to run for president <laughs> at some point, um, which was totally not that. I mean, I would never, like, I'll be the first to say I never thought I'd be running for president. Um, I'm Asian, after all. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it wasn't in the mental vocabulary of like the immigrant parents being like, you're going to. So, um, <laughs> no, that wasn't. so um, but, but each of those experiences as an entrepreneur and uh, head of a private company that, uh, you know, that, that did well and had payroll um, and working in the education and, and um, healthcare sectors all had a very profound impact on me. You mentioned entrepreneurship. We've seen in relative terms a, a collapse in entrepreneurship yes, in the last several the numbers decades. Are so bad. And so many net new jobs in the economy get created by the relatively small percentage of new ventures that take off. Yes. So it, it has this real drag on the economy. Massive. So why are we seeing this relative collapse in entrepreneurship? What could we do to reverse that trend line? Yeah, so there are a few big causes. But if you think about it, what business might you have started a generation ago? 
It might have been a hardware store or a flower shop or something on Main Street. And none of those businesses make any sense anymore because you have 1-800-Flowers and Amazon just like sucking that yeah. stuff up. Um, number two, the average student loan debt for a college grad is up to 38K. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, their home ownership like, is being pushed back. A in the old days, you might have like, not had debt and then maybe had a home that you could lean on for some seed money to start a business. Like now, all of that is completely gone. Um, and then the third thing, which is related to, to the first, is that there's this mythology that the internet makes everyone an entrepreneur, um, and it does not, really. Like, it gives everyone a social media account. Those are very, very different things. <laughs> um, and, and so, like, uh, we've actually, in many ways, raised the bar um, to start your own business in this country, because many of the opportunities have gotten um, streamlined out by uh, the internet. You mentioned higher ed. Uh, highest average uh, college uh, loan debt of any state in the country. We're sitting in it right now. Uh, and I found in my own experience, it had floated very near the top, not just for the students carrying the debt, but for the parents of those kids that either they were helping pay it, or they felt awful that they knew their kids were in the boat you just described pretty yes. well a minute ago. Yeah. So what do we do you know, as president at the federal level? What can we do to deal mm. with this enormous amount of college debt we're dealing with? Yeah, so this mountain is uh, $1.5 trillion in school loans, up from less than $100 billion in 1999. Think about that. It's gone up more than 15 times in 20 years. And uh, why is this? It's in part because college has gotten two and a half times more expensive. And it has not gotten two and a half times better. It's, uh, you know, like there hasn't been some massive quality increase. Uh, and so, uh, so you have to dig in and again say, like, why is this so much more expensive than it used to be? And it's because of bureaucratic and administrative growth uh, in the college campuses. It's not professors, it's not even buildings. Because if you build a building, you can generally get some rich person to give you money to put their name on it. So, uh, so you've had massive administrative and bureaucratic growth. And then if you're a family and you have this massive price tag, you feel like you have no choice but to pay. And then the government's like, it's, it's OK, we have this massive loan package for you. And then you're like, all right, I guess that's the thing I have to do. So you have to try and attack this at every stage. But it's so mammoth now that to me the the right thing to do is to forgive a, a significant chunk of the student loan debt of this 1.5 trillion because you have to ask yourself what would we rather our young people do stay at home living in their parents basements uh, paying off loans for years and years trying to dig out from under the debt or starting a business starting a family uh, buying their own home like doing all the things that would actually move our society forward and anyone who looks at it and says, look, we have this $1.5 trillion uh, in, in debt, it's a stimulus of the economy. Uh, you know? like, and and what, what amps me up about this is that during the financial crisis, our government had a choice. Bail out the banks or forgive the mortgage, uh, the mortgage debt that many, many Americans were holding. And we chose the banks. Not we. I mean, none of us would have chosen the banks, I don't think. <laughs> but our government chose the banks and said, here's $4 trillion, banks. And then the American people lost their homes and everything went into the gutter. And I'm going to suggest that the student loan mountain of debt is analogous. And so this time we should get it right. And we should say, look, let's like empower our young people to actually guide our society forward and like uh, take the economy in the right direction and forgive a lot of the student loan debt that was immorally generated in many cases anyway. How about uh, education before folks would get to post-secondary? Uh, how early? In this state, we're talking about finally getting full day K. We're kind of late to the dance at the state level on that topic before we even get to talk about pre-K. Uh, but let's say pre-K through 12, yeah. what's the current state of American public education and what do we need to do to take it to a higher plane? So uh, the data shows that 70 to 75 percent of kids' academic performance is determined by factors outside of school. So that's parental time and input, how many books get read to them when they're very, very young, stress levels in the household type of neighborhood. We're putting our teachers in impossible situations where we're saying, educate our children. Oh, by the way, you can only control 25 to 30 percent of it. Uh, but you know, we're going to hold you responsible for 100 percent of it. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to get money into the hands of families. And that's what this freedom dividend of 1000 bucks a month would do. Think about it. If you have two adults in the house, you get $24,000. Maybe one of you spends more time with a kid. And that helps give that kid a better chance to learn and then makes the teachers actually able to do their jobs. So number one, if you get the money into to families' hands, that helps kids learn. 
The second thing is we need to pay teachers more. And the numbers are very, very clear that a good teacher is worth his or her weight in gold, and that as a profession, we're having a hard time both enlisting and retaining teachers. And uh, one of the big problems in American life today is we just don't trust our people. Like if you gave a school a lot of money, the last thing they would do is pay the teachers more. Am I right? They'd be like, oh, we got this money? What are we gonna do? We're gonna like hire some consultants. We're gonna like buy a new system. We're gonna maybe get some like whiz-bang gadgets. And the data says the best thing they could do is just give the teachers more money. So we should just give the teachers more money. Um, the third thing is we need to invest heavily in vocational and apprenticeship. Because right now we're overselling college, um, and that's one reason why these kids like all feel like they have to get their mountain of debt. The six-year graduation rate uh, from a college, a four-year university right now is only 59%. We have hundreds of thousands of kids who are starting college who don't finish, who shouldn't have gone in the first place. So what we have to do is we have to say, look, there are other paths to a very fruitful life and livelihood other than college. And that includes technical, vocational, apprenticeship. Only 6% of American high school students are in technical training. In Germany, that percentage is 59%. Wow. Think about that gulf. <laughs> so what we get, have to get micro of dirty jobs, uh, and we'll have this public awareness campaign and say these jobs are awesome, <laughs> and then, and then we'll also make teachers' jobs easier because they won't all be saying like college, college, college. They'll be like, oh look, you know what'd be good for you? Like maybe some of these other other tracks. Uh, I want to get to audience questions in a minute, but a few other topics that I suspect I want to make sure come up uh, at any rate. Um, the way we fund elections now. It, the incentives that the Democratic National Committee have put forth to make the debate stage have had perhaps intended, as a consequence, getting a lot of people into the game at often low dollar, but uh, feeling invested in nascent campaigns. Um, you and I would argue um, South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg are two really good examples of candidates who have been able to embrace this, uh, this threshold, 65,000 unique donors, uh, a certain amount for 20, at least 200 in from 20, 20 or more states. Yep. So it has to be fairly spread out. That if you reach that threshold by, um, in this case, May, yep. you would qualify. And you you went from fewer than 10,000 to 65,000 in like a month or something like that. It's yes, a crazy right. number. Um, talk about what's going on there. And then what can we learn from this as a way to maybe bend public policy so that this is the norm of how candidates can start funding their campaigns rather than this pleasant anomaly? You know, so uh, I think many, many Americans are open to a different way of funding campaigns. Because right now the concern is that there's like this giant, um, there are these pipes that are clogged with money. Um, and that's one reason why I love being here in New Hampshire is that you all know that if you decide to get behind a particular candidate or vision, then that vision can then sweep the country. Um, most Americans don't feel anything like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like most Americans are like, oh, if I'm not a billionaire, I can't really do that much. Um, and so um, we're thrilled that we've had such incredible enthusiasm for my campaign. As you said, like I just qualified for the Democratic primary debates uh, last week. So you'll see me uh, on the debate both June and July. Um, and a lot of that was fueled by small donors. Most all of it, our average donation right now is only $19, so I joke that my fans are even cheaper than Bernie's. <laughs> uh, but but uh, this is, to me, the essence of democracy in action. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of. And I will say, too, that there are a lot of the traditional um, funders in the Democratic Party that are essentially lying in wait. They're going to, fig they're going to get behind candidates after you all decide who you, you want to support. And so this is a golden opportunity for us to move the party in a particular direction very fast because it's not just a bunch of rich people in like uh, some of the enclaves that are going to be able to make that decision. The, uh, w and what would, what would you describe? What are the factors that have caused you to experience this very positive growth? Uh, there's a lot of different, none are perfect, but taken in total, Twitter followers, low dollar donors, average contribution, um, hits uh, uh, searches on Google by all of these various and relatively new in the history of how we do this stuff in politics uh, by these uh, different metrics. There's this very there's steep like a wave. growth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's going on? You know, if I had to chalk it up to any one thing, um, it was this Joe Rogan interview, this Joe Rogan podcast I did okay. um, that's been seen on YouTube already 2.3 million times and probably heard by some multiple of that. Um, and then there was a, a few other things that happened during the same time period, like Freakonomics and, and Breakfast Club. But all of a sudden, I became cool. 
It was like, it was wild. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm very uh, excited about it. Um, but there, there's like this um, uh, sort of cumulative effect, I think, Steve, where, you know, when people start just telling their friends, being like, hey, have you seen this? Hey, have you seen mm -hmm. this? Um, and then that just snowballed in a way that it became viral. Where if you look at my, because I'm a numbers guy, so like I look at the measurements and just see the trends in terms of like interest in me and traffic. And then ordinarily after a media appearance, you'd see it go like up and then back down like this. But this time went like up and then just like stayed here and it just kept going up. Um, and, and so I'm happy to say it just started building on itself. When you were uh, 20 years ago, you were 24 years old. Yeah. 10 years ago, 34 years old. I know you mentioned earlier you didn't think you'd be running for president. What'd you think you'd be doing at 44 years old? You know, so when I was 34, 24, I mean, when I was 24, I was just, um, I was like hating my, my law firm job, being like, oh man, I have to find something I, I, I'm excited about. And then when I was 34, I was the CEO of a growth company that um, was doing quite well. Um, and then it had just been sold. And then I was driven by the fact that it seems like, it seemed to me like all the energy of the country was doing. Um, a few things in a few places when it needed to be starting businesses in more uh, communities around the country. Um, and so I thought at the time, I mean, I love this country dearly. My parents came here as immigrants uh, and gave a, created a great life for me and my brother. Uh, and so I was like, well, this is my opportunity to give back. And I just felt like I could do something when I started Venture for America. I did not realize that the problems in this country were so big, so hairy, and they're about to accelerate and take off. Like right now, the 20th century economic relationships that so many of us have taken for granted for years are breaking down. And our system does not know what to do. Uh, so as an example, like 20th century economics, if I start a, a successful company, then you're gonna assume a number of things. I'm gonna hire lots of people, I'm gonna pay them well, um, I'm going to need to make sure that they can buy my goods and I care about what happens in my own backyard. Just think about like the Henry Ford like sort of examples of capitalism. Today, I can start a very successful company and not hire lots of people. If I do hire them, I can treat them all as gig workers or contractors or temps. I don't care if they can buy my stuff because I'm selling globally, and I don't care about my own backyard because like, I'm sort of everywhere and nowhere. Um, and so our system is not accounting for this new reality. Um, we're stuck in the past fighting food fights from past decades. You know, and, and so some people think of me as a futurist. I'm a presentist. It's 2019, it's gonna be 2020. And I know what's around the corner. The more people know, the more concerned they are. And I'll finish with this. President Trump either is unaware or seemingly disinterested <laughs> in what is here and what is right around the corner as well. Um, I, <laughs> primary voters, I've had a chance to spend a lot of time with a lot of folks that are gonna be figuring out who they wanna vote for in February of 2020. And it strikes me, and I hope I don't misrepresent what a lot of you may be thinking, but it strikes me that a lot of folks, as a primary part of how they're going to decide in this extraordinary field of talented individuals and the most diverse in history, it's a fascinating and exciting field. Um, they really want to beat Donald Trump. Yes. They'd they may have their favorite. You can applaud for that. Oh, yeah. I'll applaud for that. They may have their favorite. Uh, uh, or several in tiers sure. of candidates. People already have like five tiers because there's so many candidates. <laughs> but they're like, I'm willing to go to my second, third, fourth favorite if I thought that that person gave me the best chance of beating Donald Trump. I just don't want to lose to Donald Trump. Tell me, kind of a two-parter, why are you the person best matched up to beat Donald Trump and what is his greatest vulnerability that we as Democrats should be going after to make it so? Yes. Uh, so Donald Trump's our president today in part because he got some of the problems right. But his solutions are the opposite of what we need. He's saying build a wall, turn back the clock, somehow magically bring the jobs back. And I'm saying we have to do the opposite of all that. We have to turn the clock forward. We have to start evolving in our notions of both work and value and how our economy should revolve around us. Um, but I'm 100% confident I would beat Donald Trump in the general election because I'm already getting hundreds, thousands of independents. I was on the way over here. We stopped in a rest stop. And then this guy stopped me and said, I'm switching my party affiliation to vote for you. Uh, where I'm getting thousands of Republicans and independents from around the country saying that I'm what they were hoping for when they voted for Donald Trump. 
Um, so I'm going to get the progressives behind and the Democrats because I'm about getting money into the hands of families and making our communities stronger. But I'm going to peel off a significant chunk of the independents and the libertarians uh, and the rest of it because they see I'm trying to solve the problems I got Donald Trump elected. Despite the fact that I'm kind of his polar opposite in many ways. And the, the applause line I use that the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that seems like it's good a point to end this portion because we're going to go from there. Uh, and why don't we take some questions from the audience? I think we might have a uh, we might have a uh, mic that will be hovering around to try to capture your questions. So please give a moment uh, to allow for that. Uh, let me start. I'm going to start right over here. Oh, wait. Hi, I'm very interested uh, listening to you. I, it's sort of a two prong question. It's like. To, to make change in this country? Is the, the office of president the thing to do, particularly when you have McConnell and other people blocking everything that you might want to do? And my, the other quest, part of the question is, what, you know, with your ideas of moving forward and recognizing the problem, in Lordstown, Ohio right now, where they just closed the um, plant that made the GM crews, yeah. uh, what about those people? You know, Trump is saying, I insist that you hire those people back. But how, what are you going to do for those people? Yes. Um, so let's say, thanks to you all, I become president in 2021. And we will know exactly why. It's that uh, the Asian man who wants to give everyone $1,000 a month just became president. Uh, and then the Democrats and progressives will say, let's make this happen. And then Mitch McConnell and the Republicans and conservatives will be like, wait a minute, this would be a massive win for people in rural areas and red states on the interior. This is a rebalancing of the economy that ends up funneling economic resources into many of these communities. And you do not need a super majority to get this done. You only need 51%. Keep in mind that the, that the only state that has a dividend already is Alaska, which is a deep conservative state. Now, it's one reason I named this the freedom dividend, is because it tests much better with conservatives with the word freedom in it. Uh, so we have to show the American people that we can get big things done that improve people's lives um, and then we can hopefully break down this polarization and dysfunction that is seizing up our government. As to the factory workers, you can't like browbeat executives into going against their economic incentives. I mean, like that, that's really the problem many of us are having right now is that Democrats and Republicans alike are saying like, hey, treat your people better, treat your people better, when every incentive for that executive is to, is to do the opposite. You know, it's like, and I've been a CEO, like, you know, you, you have to, the, to hew to the bottom line. So what I would do for those workers is I would say, hey, um, here's a thousand bucks a month, um, and let's try and have meaningful pass forward for you and the people in your community, um, because we need to think much, much bigger. We can't go backwards. The path forward is going to be rocky for many, many Americans, but it's going to get less rocky if we actually acknowledge what's happening in our communities and then start putting real resources to work. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, as a numbers guy, I'd like to ask you a question about the, the transformation of the tax code over the past 60 years and how it is now and what might you think about that and perhaps change it? Yeah, so um, one, thing, one thing you have to give to the, the conservatives, they're really, good at name, they're really good at naming stuff, like the death tax. It's like it used to be the estate tax and we're all for it, and then they call it death tax and somehow people turn against it. Um, most of the changes over the last number of years have been bad, um, where the, the, um, the top tax brackets come down to uh, you know, much lower rates than it had been. I would move us back towards uh, more progressive tax brackets. I would certainly do away with the carried interest loophole. I would treat capital gains the same way we do labor. Uh, I would bring the estate tax back up. But I want to suggest, too, that a lot of the stuff that people are chasing right now is not going to rebalance the economy. It's one reason why I'm so passionate about this value-added tax. And I'm going to use Jeff Bezos as my example because I like to use him a lot. So Jeff Bezos is worth $160 billion right now. The vast majority of that's an Amazon stock. Now, if I were to raise the top income tax bracket to 70%, let's say, it's actually not going to get us that much money or get that much money from Jeff because he's, not, he's too smart to have a taxable event. Like he hasn't sold the stock, you know? Uh, like rich people are so good at hiding taxes and ducking them, it is mind boggling. 
and I know this because some of my friends are like the tax lawyers and accountants that like move stuff around for them. And they're smart people. I want to, you know, it's like we have a system that unfortunately has made it possible for Amazon to pay zero in taxes and for Jeff Bezos to just, you know, like go, go all the way to the bank. So the reason why every other economy already has this value added tax is it's much, much harder to game. It's much harder to dodge than an income tax regime. And that's one reason why I'm so passionate about it. So the value added tax is a much, it sounds like a much broader tax in that sense, right? It, 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 which is what makes it harder to dodge. Oh yeah, so let's say you're Jeff Bezos and you're like, you know, you're like, ha ha ha, I avoid it. Well, first we're gonna get a slice of every Amazon transaction. So it's gonna take like billions of dollars off the top for Jeff. And then second, even if he has this $160 billion, let's say he spends a billion dollars a year on his space exploration company, which is what he's doing, by the way. Like he, like a lot of these guys, for whatever reason, just get fixated on going to Mars. Um, <laughs> So then he spends a billion dollars on like rocket engines and whatnot, which is his prerogative. I mean, you know, I'm not against it. But then we get some money on that too in the value added tax. You know, it doesn't matter if he managed to skip out on the um, income tax portion when he starts spending it on all the equipment suppliers and the people and the factories to build his rockets. We get money then too. Okay, uh, let me go right here in the corner. Great. Um, we've had three presidents in this century all of whom are novices when it comes to foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Some have done better than others. At this point, what would make you stand out as you would be a novice, but why would you stand out differently than the others? Well, I can just share with you what my philosophy would be on, on foreign policy, which is I think that our foreign policy reflects how we're doing at home. And um, we're, we are not doing well at home by the numbers. And so we elected Donald Trump, and now our partners and allies regard us as unreliable and erratic because he's you know, just uh, jumping around. And so job one is to make us actually strong and consistent at home and whole, and then to be able to project a much more reliable and sustained foreign policy that's more restrained and judicious. Because I think we've gotten ourselves into massive entanglements by deluding ourselves into thinking we could do things that we could not. We've spent over a trillion dollars, cost thousands of American lives, tens of thousands of non-American lives, to very unclear achievements in many contexts. And so my philosophy would be to, to say, look, we have to, more, uh, we have to rely more on our partners and allies. And then if we do decide to get involved in something, we need to have very, very clear goals and a clear timeline. Quick follow-up on that. It, uh, one, you mentioned earlier Donald Trump identified some of the problems correctly, but terrible on the solution end of it. Yes. In terms of uh, trade uh, and uh, that America, relative to other countries, needs to trade for its own uh, existence, survival and success, less than a lot of other countries do on that basis. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Uh, right? We do a lot yeah. of it for, uh, for uh, defense, to build relationships, and, and that's worked pretty well since World War II. But there have been a lot of changes. He's taken it very strongly in one direction and seemed to blow up a lot of 70 plus year old relationships that have generally seemed to keep us out of World War III. Where are you in terms of the, the um, rebuilding or uh, creation in some cases of these uh, international alliances relative to Trump? Yeah. So America has been the massive beneficiary of a world order that we helped create. And then we've pulled back on elements of that this last number of years, uh, and I don't think that's the right approach. So I would rebuild relationships. I would become much more um, multilateral in our engagements. Um, one thing I would do is I would push the power to declare military action back to Congress where it belongs. Uh, you know, instead of having. Uh, and I think that many of our allies would find me to be a, like a very reliable and reasonable and trustworthy partner. Um, I'd also suggest that, there are, that there, I'm a cult hero in parts of Asia, and so I think there'd be some people there that are very excited. Uh. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the value added tax again. I, you said that it would be something that would be very difficult for these corporations to sort of weasel out of. Yep. What's to stop these corporations across the board from just passing on the cost to us and in effect almost canceling out the effect of UBI? I, I guess I worry about a time in the far-flung future where everything's become so much more expensive because they're sure is not going to take a hit on their profits. Yeah. Uh, so the, the happy thing is that uh, if you imagine a New Hampshire where everyone here was getting an additional $1,000 a month, um, 
that would be a game changer in a much more significant way than if some of your prices on Amazon and whatnot were to like go up a smidge. Um, because most of the money would stay right here in New Hampshire. You would spend it on uh, tutoring and food, car repairs you've been putting off, like the, uh, the night out at like a you know, local establishment, like this place, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Um, <laughs> and so a lot of the money would circulate over and over again throughout the community. Um, and it's not like people in your community would all of a sudden start gouging you, like uh, in part because there's still competition between different businesses. One of the examples I use is like, let's say I'm president 2021, the dividend starts coming through, you're like, wow, we made the right choice, this is uh, excellent. And then you come go out to the local burger joint, all of a sudden their burgers are $10 instead of $5. Like, are you gonna be like, oh, that, that's fine, I made of money? Like, of course not. You'd be like, what happened to this freaking <laughs> like menu? Why is it so much more expensive? Um, and then you'd go someplace else and then all it takes is one business to you know, not gouge you and then the other businesses more or less follow suit. So to the extent there's some kind of mild pricing, um, people would end up, end up way ahead, except for approximately the top 4% of Americans and right now the top 4% of Americans hold a lot of the wealth and are spending a lot of it. So the, the beauty of this system is we can get the money from where the money is and then put it in the hands of uh, American families and consumers. To the extent that there is any price difference, it's not going to hit people in New Hampshire. It's going to hit, frankly, the people that are buying yachts and whatnot. Thank you. Okay, uh, yes sir. With the value added tax, how would that affect people like us? Yes. So, um, so the great thing about a value added tax too in other societies is you can actually um, make it fall more heavily on certain luxury purchases and exempt certain consumer staples. Like, uh, you know, my, my proposal assumes that you have like a blanket rate, but you can very easily exempt things that people rely upon for day-to-day -day uses or have like a lower rate. So the, the goal would be to have it so that people have more resources in their families and communities um, and then we're getting the money from where the money is. Let me try to get, I, the lighting makes it, looking for a hand way in the back, or at least as close as I can. I'll keep looking. I see a gentleman in a blue shirt back there. Yes, you. Uh, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and directly affects either as people that have the disease or family members that help care for them, about 100,000 granite staters. So if you're elected, what would you do to address Alzheimer's? Yeah, I, I have uh, friends whose parents um, have been struggling with Alzheimer's as well. My brother's research touches on, on uh, some, of the, um, some of the elements of the disease. Um, so big picture, we need to do much, much more for aging Americans generally, and Alzheimer's obviously like a component of that. And that's the way we, in my opinion, need to move our entire economy. Um, because right now, we, uh, the, the problem we have right now is we have GDP as our measuring stick, and then we see people with Alzheimer's as like cost centers, essentially. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, we see our children as cost centers. Um, and the, the problem is that GDP um, is going to drive us off a cliff, because if you have self-driving trucks, going to be great for GDP, and it's going to be terrible for humans. It's going to be terrible for humans in New Hampshire. So the goal is to actually make it so that our health and well-being and our mental health and the health of our seniors is actually the measuring stick that we have for our economy. And then we can move huge levels of resources in that direction. Um, because if you have loved ones who are suffering from Alzheimer's, it sometimes like, it's very, very expensive, the managed care, insurance might not be able to handle a lot of it. Um, so I would be all for um, helping make those resources much more robust and seeing caring for those, um, those families as a public obligation. Uh, yes. Uh, so you've spoken at length on uh, economic and numbers issues, but high, how, how high of a priority are issues such as women's health and LGBT issues like conversion therapy and transgender discrimination to you? And what would you plan to do to address those issues? Yeah, so uh, I mean, our, our slogan is humanity first. Uh, and uh, you know, I have a, like a gay staffer um, and then some, like I live in New York, so you can imagine like I have many, many LGBTQ friends. Um, and one of the things they say to me is that LGBTQ Americans are more likely to get kicked out of the house and fired from jobs, um, and that if they had $1,000 a month, that it would at least help them um, b like, uh, be able to make those sorts of adjustments. Like they said to me, it's like this would be a game changer for people in, in the LGBTQ community in the same way it would for other Americans. Uh, my wife is at home with our two boys right now, one of whom is autistic, and one of the things I say is like, what is uh, the market value her work at right now? Zero. 
Um, and so it turns out that trying to evolve in our, uh, our sense of measuring economic value and our worth is actually deeply tied to women's issues in particular because we all know that women do the vast majority of the unrecognized and uncompensated work in our society. And so if the Democratic Party is going to be seriously about empowering women, then we need to start moving economic resources towards women in something like the Freedom Dividend because right now there are thousands of women in New Hampshire and millions around the country who are stuck in exploited over abusive jobs or relationships that $1,000 a month would actually help them improve. So I'm not saying that money is the answer to everything, but I'm saying that money actually would make a bigger difference in many people's lives than um, some of the other things that people are discussing. But I'm, I'm already committed to having an LGBTQ um, official at the highest levels of government because it's, it's very, very important for people to know that, um, that uh, you know, leaders represent society. And uh, one question that you didn't, I don't think, well, I think you mentioned reproductive health. I believe it's early part of your oh, question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry about Could that. You, just I want to make sure you touch on that. Oh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I don't think men should have anything to do with deciding uh, women's reproductive issues. <laughs> No, it's like, uh, like we all know that if men got pregnant, um, laws would be very, very different. Um, and, and so I think, I think that men should just be like, you got this, and then leave. And I have a feeling I know what women would decide, but it should be up to women to decide for themselves. I do, one, one of the things that doesn't get discussed a lot, even in some of the interviews I've seen you do dealing uh, with the Freedom Dividend, is it does, you just touched on this, and I hadn't heard you describe it this way before. Uh, I can say this is a white guy. Um, the economy in a myriad of ways, some very subtle, some not so subtle, still pretty clearly advantages the white guy uh, because of the way that we've defined value of work. Yeah. Uh, and that is an enormous structural question. Like it, it's this, you know, we, we often talk about policy in these fairly granular ways and it makes it hard to get at these enormous societal changes that would be required to at least begin addressing in order to actually fix a lot of the smaller, quote unquote, smaller things that we spend all our time on. So it seems like a lot of the policies, as you talk about universal uh, basic income, begin to touch at least in some way on almost everything else that you're getting asked about tonight. Uh, yeah, and so I agree that the economic system right now is very much geared towards men. And so if you're passionate about uh, women's rights and empowerment, which uh, we all should be, then your choice in my mind is you go to each individual organization and say, hey, like you're geared towards men unfairly uh, over women, which most of them are. <laughs> and so you can go to each organization and say, hey, like try and make that better. I'm going to suggest that's like a very, very difficult um, thing to change in each organization. Mm -hmm. You know what's going to be much easier? If a majority of us get together and say, you know what? The market does not determine our value. Um, we are the centers of this economy and we can easily declare a dividend of thousand dollars a month and make it so that everyone has at least some baseline value and then start moving from there. And that, you know, th this is a great thing, I'm a numbers guy. All we need is about 50,000 people in the state of New Hampshire to get behind that message and then we make it real. Like that's something we can do. We can control our capital flows much more quickly and powerfully then we can control just about anything else. If I were to say to you, hey, we need to change our schools, we know that's really, really hard. If I were to say, we need to change our culture, very, very hard. If I want to say, we can change capital flows and get everyone a dividend, we can 100% do that. All we need is enough people to embrace the vision of a trickle-up economy from human beings, families, and communities up, and we can make it real. And then that improves the lives of women and people of color and LGBTQ Americans in a way that we'll be able to, to celebrate um, after we pass this law. Uh, let me go one, two, three. Let me hit this side and then come back. So let me start with you, sir. So first of all, thank you for coming up here. As a future unemployed radiologist, I, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that I want to talk to you about, your numbers, guys. So you've been mentioning uh, there's this thing called this modern monetary theory where we can keep accumulating debt, national debt, budget debt, and things are going to be okay. I want to hear your opinion on that and if there's a plan to fix that in your mind. So. Yeah, so, uh, so I think that America's deficit is an issue. 
um, and that we need to try and get our spending under control uh, in, in some way moving forward. You can't just have like, uh, you know, like rising spending ad infinitum. Uh, that said, we right now have the flexibility to make meaningful moves and in investments. Um, we are still the global reserve currency. Um, if we decide to invest in our people, we can. As an entrepreneur and business person, we always talk about investing in our people. But then in the public sector, it's the opposite. It's like, don't invest in anyone. And you know what? We end up investing or spending money on people anyway in things like prisons and shelters and emergency rooms. I was just here in New Hampshire a couple of months ago, and a corrections officer said to me, uh, he said, we should pay people to stay out of jail. Because when they're in jail, we just spend so much. <laughs> so we right now have the flexibility where we can make big moves. And if we make this move, I'm happy to say it's going to pay for itself many times over. And, but I take our spending seriously. There are things I would scale back and rechannel um, because I don't think that we have the ability just to um, print money and not have it, anything negative happen in the future. If I, as a follow-up, uh, we spend a lot of money on defense. Uh, it is the largest non-mandatory uh, yep. outlay in our, uh, in our budget. Uh, where are you on opportunities to do something about the sheer number of dollars that we spend in defense without compromising our ability to defend ourselves and, and our interests? Yeah, so we're spending $750 billion or so we know about um, uh, on yeah. our military each year. Uh, and a lot of that's going towards things that may or may not be contributing to our safety at this point. Uh, and so you have to look and say, what are the true threats um, to our safety today? And my list would go something like climate change, uh, cybersecurity and AI, uh, infrastructure, loose nuclear material. And so does having like a, you know, a massive new um, aircraft carrier help with uh, some of those plans? It's like some of them not as much. So one of the goals I would have is to channel some of the military defense spending towards an infrastructure budget because you know you're going to need infrastructure for uh, forever. You know that right now we're, our infrastructure is falling apart. Um, it's literally becoming dangerous. Um, and many champions of the military industrial complex will just be like, jobs, jobs, jobs. And so you can be like, hey, these are jobs too. <laughs> you know, we can like make this happen. Um, and that would actually make us safer and help prepare us for climate change. Um, and that's one way, hopefully, we can make our expenditures much more efficient because infrastructure has much more positive economic value. Uh, question back here. I'd like to hear what your environmental policy is in regards to climate change. Yeah, so you probably uh, probably gathered, I, I think climate change is a serious existential threat uh, where the last four years have been the four <laughs> warmest years in recorded history. So you don't need to be a scientist to, to think that this is about to get even more uh, catastrophic. So I'm for rejoining the Paris Accords, I'm for carbon fee and dividend, I'm for investing in a much more sustainable infrastructure. I'm for the uh, vision of the Green New Deal. Um, but I, I would say uh, two things that make me somewhat different from other candidates on this. First, I think that financial insecurity is hand in hand with this issue. Because if 57% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $500 bill and 78% are living paycheck to paycheck, they have a mindset of scarcity where they literally just like, have their heads down trying to you know, survive. And then if you go to them and say, hey, we need to worry about climate change, some of them will say, I can't pay my bills. You know, the penguins will have to wait. Uh, and so again, we can control our capital flows much more quickly than we can um, anything else. So if we pass the dividend and then we get their heads up, we replace this mindset of scarcity that is sweeping our nation with a mindset of abundance, not 100%, but like 60, 40. And then we go to them and say, hey, we need to worry about climate change. They'll look at their children and say, yes, we do. So this is an accelerant. To, uh, to galvanizing energy around climate change. The second thing is this brutal reality that the United States of America is only 15% of global emissions. And a lot of this discussion seems to suggest that we're 100%. That if we somehow cut back, then the entire Earth will like stop warming. Um, the reality is even if we went at it wholeheartedly, and I want to go at it wholeheartedly, um, the truth is that we're probably just going to slow the rate incrementally. And that we need to start looking at carbon capture and sequestration and other geoengineering with the expectation that the climate's going to warm um, regardless of our countermeasures. Uh, yes. Um, you're remarkably popular amongst the far right users of 4chan, um, which we all know is correlated with the tragedy in Christchurch over the, the last week. Um, and you've taken the very bold step. I don't think anybody else I've 
ever seen do this, tell people you don't want them supporting you. So what's that like for you running a progressive campaign with far right supporters and then telling them that you don't want their support? Yeah, th this is a situation I never thought I'd be in. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, part of me is just like, 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 have they actually seen me? It's <laughs> one part. Of, I'm, I'm literally the son of immigrants. <laughs> Arguing on a, on a platform that's trying to, to, you know, help like all Americans. Um, and so, like you said, I completely disavow uh, the support of any um, groups that hold to hateful ideologies or things that are, frankly, diametrically opposed to everything I stand for. Um, yeah, I don't want their support uh, and uh, wish I didn't have it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I, you know, one thing I will say is that, like, it has spurred me to try and introduce myself more quickly to more people because it's like, man, like, you know, someone doesn't know me very well. <laughs> I have to, like, try and, you know, um, you know have, help people see that, like, obviously, that, that's, like, the opposite of who I am. Okay, uh, a few more questions. Uh, let me, s it's, I, I love the, the bright lights, it makes it better for viewing, but let me, I see a hand right behind the cameras here, yes. Hi, uh, you have talked a little bit about election finances, but can you speak a little bit about election reform and the Electoral College and those controversies? Yes. So the, the electoral, so campaign finance reform to me is a huge priority. Where right now Americans are despairing that our democracy is not real and that it's been overrun by money. So here's my solution. As president, I will pass a bill that puts 100 democracy dollars into the hands of every American uh, citizen of voting age that you can only give to political candidates and campaigns each year and then the money disappears if you don't use it. Now why is this important? The reason this is important is that if someone runs for office right now, let's call him Steve, um, he can get lots and lots of people behind him, um, but then maybe uh, he has to go someplace else for money, and he's like a, a, you know, an uncompromising, principled guy, and so he doesn't want to do that. Um, now, in the world of democracy dollars, if 10,000 people in New Hampshire love Steve, then he'll get a million dollars. And then if there's some corporate interest being like, hey, Steve, like I've got 25,000, he'll be like, oh, shove off. I don't need your 25,000, uh, you know, which is the way it ought to work. Now, now, do we try? Do we want to get corporate money out of politics? Yes, but we have to acknowledge the fact that certain people and companies have money. So the better approach is just to wash it out, because by the numbers, if every citizen had hundred dollars, that would mean we had five times as much money than the companies currently spend on lobbying. So that's campaign finance reform. You have to just give everyone democracy dollars, and then that changes the balance very, very quickly. In terms of electoral college. Uh, you know, the, the reforms I'm in favor of are a little more nuanced and textured, um, where I if you had just popular vote, then the truth is that candidates would just go to urban areas and big media markets, uh, and, you know, that that's would be where the incentives are. Um, I actually think it's very bad form for Democrats to essentially be like, hey, Constitution has a system. We've lost a couple elections on that system. Let's change the system. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, like th that's not principled, really. And the, the constitutional framers had some intention in mind um, when they set it up this way. So, uh, you know, to me, there are reforms I would consider, like having electoral college votes allocated proportionally in each state so that you don't wind up just hitting the swing states, where if I go to Utah and get some people <coughs> behind me, like maybe I swing it a little bit and like get an electoral vote or two, um, then that would be a better set of reforms that I'd be in favor of. The entire popular vote thing has some unintended consequences that I'm not sure people are really um, reflecting on. So, uh, for example, maybe uh, by congressional district? You mean in terms of the proportional the electoral, electoral When you mentioned the proportionality within states, something like uh, congressional districts within it? Yeah, yeah, that, that would be an improvement because then you'd at least find a swing district. Um, you could even go even further and say just based upon the uh, percentage of vote like um, pro rata and oh, okay. so if you get anyone um, though district would work too, that would be an improvement. And we do have a few states, uh, right, that already do that. Maine, uh, the winner gets a certain amount overall, and then each district, and then Nebraska, I think, is, uh, does that. Yeah. Actually, I think President Obama won an electoral vote in Nebraska once upon a time. So, yeah, yeah, I think I saw that. So it happens. I, I'm uh, also for ranked choice voting. That would be a massive improvement um, in our process. Uh, yes. Um, this next election, 
election, there's not going to be campaign finance reform. And the Amazons and the upper 4% and the big companies are not going to like what you're saying. How are you going to communicate that to people so they will vote for you? Because um, they're going to label you somehow, some way, because they're going to have lots of money to do that. So here's where it gets interesting. Um, I have the support of like over 100 techies in Silicon Valley and other places. Because if I sit down with them and I say, hey, guys, you automating away all the most common jobs? They're like, yes, yes, we are. <laughs> and then I say, how do you feel about that? And they say, not great. And then say, would you be willing to take a haircut to keep our country together and keep people from disintegrating and rioting over time? And then about half of them, not all of them, half of them are like, no, I have no interest. Um, but half of them are like, yeah, like uh, I do have an interest. Sign me up. I just got a text message from the CEO of a major tech company like congratulating me on the awesome work I was doing. So it, this is not like a villainizing thing where um, some of these techies are, you know, parents, patriots. Like the, the, the thing is we're all just captive to the system. Like they're doing their job and their job is eliminating other jobs. Um, and uh, they don't feel great about it. Um, but if you go to them and ask them for help, I can't get them all, but I can get enough of them. And if you have a sense of me, like I was invited to speak to 70 CEOs at like a major bank. Like the, the folks who are um, at the top of American business that know me actually see me as eminently reasonable, non-ideological, quite practical. Um, and, uh, but the other thing is that in a democracy, like, you know, if I get enough people, like it doesn't really matter what these people think. Um, but like I'm a reasonable man and like anyone wants to work with me. And I'm friends with enough of them where it's not going to be clean cut like either way. A quick sort of follow up to that. Now that you've been in this for a little while, um, what do you think of the way we pick presidents? Mm -hmm. I don't mean like the electoral college and the, like, I don't mean the actual mechanics. I mean like the maelstrom of like going to Iowa and standing on a counter or going to New Hampshire and doing like, or, or any place or the fact that a lot of states, you don't actually go there very much because it's like the 37th state on the map on the order. Things I know, like that. Yeah. I, I do get messages from people tell, asking me to go to states that I'm like, this, I, I probably can't make it there. I feel bad. You know, it's like, like, is there a reason for me to go to, you know, Nebraska? It's like, <laughs> it's like well, um, but I, I think that the, uh, I think the political culture in New Hampshire is so magical and special where like I, I was at a house party and then the person said like Barack Obama stood at the exact same place 10 years ago like uh, and, and gave a similar talk. Um, and just reflecting on what that means, like you all actually see us come through and then you're not just comparing us to each other in that moment. You're comparing us to candidates from like, you know, 12 years ago. Like you've seen it all. You have such a highly developed political culture and you know that your votes can change the course of history. You take it super seriously. Um, I, like I, I think that this process has built up an incredible level of discernment um, and investment that I can't imagine it changing, like having gone through it now um, in, in some measure. Because if you tried to have some other state do this, they would have no idea what to do. You know what I mean? Like, like this is nothing, like none of the infrastructure, they would just be at a loss. Um, and, and so I think uh, this system uh, has stood the test of time for really good reason. Let me take two more questions and then we'll give you a little time to dive in. Uh, let me go. Uh, yeah, you know what? Fair enough. And the angle of the chair matters so much, it turns out. So let me be fair. Apologies. Let me go one, two, and that's how we'll close out this portion. I'd like you to address two things um, the Second Amendment or gun control, and also farming. Yes. Um, what about farming? Local farm, big farming. Sure. Address it all. <laughs> uh, so. So on, on, um, on Second Amendment uh, issues, I'm, I'm pro-gun safety. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, it's a tough issue because Americans feel very strongly about it on both sides. And, and there are- Do you mean licensing? Yes. I'm, I'm, so, so to me, it's licensing classes. It's, uh, to me, the treatment should be analogous to what we do for uh, vehicles, where, you know, vehicles can cause accidents and kill How people. How do you address the constitutional issue then? Well, so, you know, you have to get uh, buy-in from Congress. I mean, obviously, it can't be the president passes laws. And so, like, you have to have Congress say, look, there's a constitutional right to bear arms, um, but there also are legitimate public safety uh, concerns that as long as you're not really abridging that right fundamentally, that if you just jump through, uh, like, a couple of straightforward hoops that for the average law-abiding American won't present undue difficulty, then that could very well pass 
um, an appropriate standard. And so that would be my um, hope, my plan, my proposal would be like, look, let's try and find a zone of agreement with responsible gun owners. Because many responsible gun owners um, also want there to be some kind of process in place um, so that people, you know, that they feel uh, better about the, the way people get access to firearms. I'm just going to follow up, sorry. I'm wearing the stone from New Zealand. I'm a Texan. And I hope that you'll make some friends with people in the NRA because the thing is, is the constitutional versus the safety thing, and you got to do the bridge there. Yeah, and and so uh, I'm, you know, I see myself as someone who's very, again, pragmatic. Like I want to find that zone of agreement. Though my general stance on this is that we need to do more um, because, um, you know, there there've just been too many, uh, too many tragedies uh, in this country, and and not enough. Um, to be done to curb them in the future. I mean, if you have parents, like your kids are literally like worried about school shootings and whatnot, like on a daily basis, and, and we can do better than that. Um, on farms, I think farms are like a microcosm of what's going on in the rest of the economy, where you're, you've essentially gotten overrun by big business, and then like big business just crowded out small um, small farms, and then the farms too, they uh, the next generation doesn't necessarily want to take over the farm, and so you wind up with huge succession issues. And then um, the big farms are just trying to buy you for less than what you're worth. Um, and, and so we have to do more to, to combat the almighty dollar in um, the farming industry. Uh, we have to try and curb some of this rampant corporate power that I, I know is going on from some of the big suppliers. And um, uh, and when I was in Iowa, I sound so politician-y, I apologize, but when I was in Iowa, Last week, um, you know, someone just told me about this company that's selling like a, an automated tractor for half a million dollars that's just going to, um, you know, and, and obviously like if you can afford a half a million dollar automated tractor, you're probably like like pretty big uh, farming operation. So that, that there are these things that are happening in, in um, agriculture that reflect what's going on in the rest of the economy. And we have to give the equivalent of small businesses, which is in this case small farmers, a fighting chance. Okay, uh, final question, yes. Uh, my family has a lot of land in what is now uh, Israel, and uh, I'm just asking basically what would you do uh, to support people who are standing up against uh, Netanyahu and uh, oppressive apartheid regimes in this country, and how would your um, cost-cutting internationally affect the amount of money we give every year to Israel and countries like Israel. You know, I, I'm not sure I actually said I would cut costs. Um, you know, what, what I said was that I'd want to get less entangled in various, and what I had in mind was like military interventions. Um, so uh, in terms of the money we're giving to an ally like Israel, um, my first instinct would be like, why would we reduce it? Uh, you know, uh, and so, um, so certainly if I communicated something else, like uh, that's not the, um, the idea at all. Um, there are certain relationships we have that to me we need to rebuild and strengthen. And I would suggest that our relationship with Israel uh, is one of them. And what about the Arabs? Um, you know, you'd have to look at it in a case by case and say like what's happening in terms of our, our bilateral relationship with a particular party. Um, but my, my zeal is to try and build strong alliances and partnerships. If someone's been working with us for a long time, they should feel like they're being rewarded for that, frankly. And then if someone has an interest in working with us, we should uh, be open to rewarding that too. Um, but for each country, you know, like you'd have to look at what's going on um, at that time and what the lead-in has been. So when it comes to land in Israel that's uh, being taken, even though it was granted to certain Palestinian families by the UN, uh, how do you feel about uh, constricting Israel almost to prevent that from happening and uh, constricting uh, political influence by American leaders in Israel? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll answer it more generally, um, which is like my, my, my stance on this is that it's going to be hard for the United States to constrict like uh, an ally or really just about any of its partners uh, in a decision that they feel is central to them. And I don't think that's our priority. It's not that we're somehow giving people aid so that we can then twist their arm about things that, uh, you know, that they find important. Okay. Uh, you'll be uh, available to mingle a bit. Why don't you tell folks the website, uh, how they can help, all that sort of thing before we unleash yes. you to the crowd. So um, thank you all for this. Uh, first, let's give Steve a round of applause. For the yeah.
Um, th th this may or may not be uh, politically correct, but Steve is my governor. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so I don't even know what that means, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, no, in my mind. Um, so uh, thank you for coming out tonight. If you'd like to find out more about me and the platform, as Steve said, we have over 75 policies on the website. It's yang2020.com or just Google Andrew Yang. And if you'd like to keep tabs, if you just give a dollar to the campaign, that's actually immensely helpful because then we can show that we have support here in New Hampshire. And we can keep you apprised of everything that's happening. I also have gifts which are, you see this book, this hardcover book here um, uh, up front. Uh, the paperback comes out on April 2nd, and we have copies for everyone here on the desk. Um, and so you can just grab one at will, um, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, so please do just come ask questions. Uh, if you come with a book, I'm very happy to sign. Uh, but thank you, Steve. Thank you, coming in, and thank you, New Hampshire. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.